Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. I'm Andrea M and this is Real Crime Down Under. Up until the mid-1990s, hitchhiking in Australia was viewed as an adventurous and inexpensive, if not completely safe, means of travel. However, unsolved Australian missing persons cases, such as that of Trudy Adams in 1978, Tony Jones 1982, Noko Onda in 1987, and Anna Rosa Lever in 1991, led those who still hitchhike to begin traveling in pairs for safety. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, several backpackers began to disappear. One case involved a young Victorian couple from Frankston, Deborah Everest, 19, and James Gibson, also 19, who had been missing since leaving Sydney for Confest near Albury on the 30th of December, 1989. Another related to Simone Schmidl, 21, from Germany, who had been missing since leaving Sydney for Melbourne on the 20th of January, 1991. Similarly, a German couple, Gabor Norgebauer and Anja Hapschied, had disappeared after leaving King's Cross for Mildura on the 26th of December, 1991. Another involved missing British backpackers, Carolyn Clark, 21, and Joanne Walters, 22, who were last seen in King's Cross on the 18th of April, 1992. But before we explore today's case any further, if you enjoy missing persons cases, real crime, disasters, the unsolved, the unexplained, and a little paranormal investigating thrown in, then you've come to the right channel because that's mainly all that I do here. So if this all sounds good to you, please do me the favor of repeatedly offending the like button, abducting the subscribe button, and share the love with your friends. It's subscribers like you who make it possible for creators like me to continue making content for you guys just like this. Without further preamble, let's begin. And by now I'm sure you've already figured out who and what this week's video is about. It has been a much highly requested video uh, by people who actually know me in the community or the local I come up to me and say when are you going to do this case? I've had a few DMs about it. So without further ado, this week's video is The Backpacker Murders and Ivan Milat. The Backpacker Murders were a spate of serial killings that took place in New South Wales between 1989 and 1993, committed by Ivan Milat. The bodies of seven missing young people aged 19 to 22 were discovered partially buried in the Belangolo State Forest 15 kilometres or 9.3 miles southwest of the New South Wales town of Berrimer. Five of the victims were foreign backpackers, three German and two British, and two were Australians from Melbourne. But before we delve into the murders themselves, let's take a look at the background of Even After Death, one of Australia's most prolific and violent serial killers, Ivan Milat. An avid shooter and hunter, Ivan Robert Marco Milat was born on the 27th of December 1945, the fifth of 14 siblings and one of 10 brothers. From the outside, the early years of his life were unremarkable in post-war Australia. His father worked on the wharves in Sydney after migrating from Croatia after the First World War, while his devoted mother cared for the children. His father, a strict disciplinarian, eventually started a tomato plantation at the family property in Moorbank, Western Sydney, where his sons were put to work. And the neighbours have described the family as insular, and the young Malat did not stand out at this point amongst his siblings. But as they began to grow older, the hold of the parents started to slip. Petty theft and troublemaking graduated to break and enters and burglary. Seven of the 10 brothers have had run-ins with the law and the Malat family became very well known to the local police. Ivan Malat leaned into that lifestyle. In the late 1960s, during his late teens and early 20s, he served increasingly long stints in jail for a series of break and enters and burglary. 
Milat, a fan of fast cars and brill cream with a quiet charm and a fastidious nature, would also find time to have affairs with two of his brother's girlfriends in the same period. So he's already just beginning the path that he would follow that would make him one of our worst serial killers to date. Can you imagine though, you have a girlfriend and your younger brother or older brother comes and steals her off you. He's already a stand-up guy. Mm. As Malat got older, he was linked to crimes of increasing severity. In the 1970s, he was tried but acquitted of indecently assaulting 18-year-old Margaret Peterson, who, you guessed it, had been hitchhiking to Melbourne with a friend. And Malat was often heard bragging to his friends about his capacity for violence. In one instance, he described to an acquaintance how to turn a person, and this is horrible. Uh, if you're familiar with Wolf Creek, you'll know what I'm talking about. How to turn a person into a head on a stick by stabbing them in the spine. So this may sound familiar to you if you are familiar with the Wolf Creek films. The serial killer Michael Taylor, or Uncle Mick, played by John Jarrett, says this to one of his victims just before he murders them. He makes her into exactly what Ivan Milat has described, the head on the stick. And the character of Mick Taylor was loosely based on Ivan Milat. Ivan was also an avid shooter and often hunted in the Belangolo forest where the bodies of his victims were found. The crimes for which Malat served his sentence began in December of 1989. On the day before New Year's Eve, Deborah Everest and James Gibson from Melbourne set off from Sydney towards Albury near the border of New South Wales and Victoria for an alternative lifestyle festival. They had planned to meet friends, but they never arrived. When neither made contact with family in the weeks following, their relatives filed a missing persons report. Police were not immediately concerned. The other five victims followed similar paths. Simone Schmidl, 21 from Germany, left Sydney for Melbourne on the 20th of January 1991. She had actually been due to meet her mother at the Melbourne airport four days later. Gabor Norgebauer and Anja Hapschied, also German, left Sydney on Boxing Day in 1991. The couple was supposed to be making the 4,000 kilometre trek to Darwin before returning to Munich a month later. They would never get on the plane. Carolyn Clark, a 21 from Surrey, and Joanne Walters, a 22 from Maesteg in Wales, met at a backpackers hostel in Sydney's Kings Cross and they also shared a flat there. They had hitchhiked together a number of times in Australia and they had hitchhiked to the small town of Mildura in Victoria and on the way to Tasmania to pick fruit. In April of 1992 they left Sydney again with vague plans that seemed to involve heading south towards Victoria or to Perth in Western Australia. When weeks passed without any contact with their parents, the two families would spring into action, alerting the police in the UK and Australia and using the media to drum up interest in the case. It didn't take long for journalists to start linking their disappearance with the other cases. In April 1992, an Australian television program followed Norga Bauer's parents as they searched for their son, pointing to the other missing backpackers. But it wasn't until September 1992 when two runners discovered the first of the bodies, Clark and Walters, that the severity of the crimes began to emerge. Walters had been stabbed 21 times in the back and 14 times in her chest. Her spine had been severed by one vicious blow. Lying in scrub 10 metres away, Clark had been shot 10 times in the head while blindfolded and stabbed in the chest. But the grisly discoveries would not end there. A year later, in October of 1993, 
A bushman collecting firewood found another body. It would be the body of James Gibson. Police would find Deborah Everest nearby. A month later, the three Germans were discovered. Like Clark and Walters, all had been viciously murdered. In response to the fines on the 14th of October 1993, Task Force Air, containing more than 20 detectives and analysts, was set up by the New South Wales Police. On the 5th of November 1993, the New South Wales Government increased the reward in relation to the Balangalo serial killings to $500,000. Public warnings were also given, particularly aimed at international backpackers to avoid hitchhiking along the Hume Highway at this time. After developing their profile of the killer, the police faced an enormous volume of data from numerous sources. Investigators applied link analysis technology to the Roads and Traffic Authority, vehicle records, gym memberships, gun licensing and internal police records. As a result, a list of suspects was progressively narrowed to a short list of 230 and then to an even shorter list of only 32. There were similar aspects to all the murders. Each of the bodies had been dumped in remote bushland and covered by a pyramid of sticks and ferns. Forensic study determined that each had suffered multiple stab wounds to the torso and many showed signs of indecent assault. The killer, probably a local with a four wheel drive vehicle, had evidently restrained and spent considerable time with the victims both during and after the murders. As campsites were discovered close to the location of each body. Matching .22 bullets, shell casings and cartridge boxes from two weapons also linked the crime scenes. Speculation arose that the crimes were the work of several killers, given that most of the victims had been attacked while in pairs and had been killed in different ways and buried separately. On the 13th of November, 1993, police received a call from a man named Paul Onions, 24, in the UK. On the 25th of January, 1990, Onions had been backpacking in Australia and, while hitchhiking from Liverpool Station towards Mildura, had accepted a ride south of Kasula from a man known only as Bill, south of the town of Mittagong and less than one kilometre from Belangolo State Forest. The trip began uneventfully, but as they made their way down the highway, Onions became unsettled by questions the man who gave his name as Bill began to ask him. Bill started asking Paul, did anybody know where he was headed? Was anybody waiting for him in Canberra? Had he done any special forces training in the Navy? As the car approached the Belangolo State Forest, the driver suddenly pulled to the side of the road, saying he wanted to find some cassettes to play. Instead, he produced a gun and a length of rope telling Onions, this is a robbery. Paul didn't waste any time. The backpacker made a run for it, the two fought, and the man fired a shot before Onions managed to flag down a car and escape. Onions would flag down Joanne Berry, a passing motorist, and together they sped off and he described the assailant and his vehicle to the Barrel Police. On the 13th of April 1994, detectives refound the note regarding Onions' call and sought the original report from the Barrel Police, but it was missing. And it seems to happen a lot in these cases. Where are these police reports going? I just find it very strange that they just go missing. But fortunately, a constable had recorded details in her notebook. Onions' statement was corroborated by Berry, who had also contacted the investigation team, along with the girlfriend of a man who worked with Ivan Molat, and they thought that he should be questioned over the case. It was six years later that Onions' testimony would be crucial to Molat's conviction. On the 26th of February 1994, police surveillance of the Molat house at Cinnabar Street, Eagle Vale, commenced. 
Police learnt that Malat had recently sold his silver Nissan Patrol four-wheel drive shortly after the discovery of the bodies of Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters. Police also confirmed that Malat had not been working on the days of any of the attacks and acquaintances also told police about Malat's obsession with weapons. Malat's brother, Bill, so he is attacking people, murdering them, and he's telling them his name's Bill. He uses his brother's name, who often had his identity used by his brother for work or vehicle registrations, was questioned by the investigators. When the connection between the Belangolo murders and Onion's experience was made, Onion's flew to Australia to help with the investigation. And how courageous was that of Paul Onion's? This man is obviously still on the loose. He had obviously put the fear of God into Paul, but still he comes back to help with the case. And I think that was just so brave of him. On the 5th of May, 1994, Onions positively identified Malat as the man who had picked him up and attempted to murder him. Malat was arrested at his home on the 22nd of May, 1994 on robbery and weapons charges related to the Onions attack after 50 police officers surrounded the premises, including heavily armed officers from the Tactical Operations Unit. The search of Malat's home revealed various weapons, including a .22 calibre and Schultz model 144-142 rifle and parts of a .22 calibre Ruger 10-22 rifle that matched the type used in the murders. They would also find a Browning pistol and a Bowie knife. Also, and this is the most telling of all the evidence, also uncovered was foreign currency, clothing, a tent, sleeping bags, camping equipment and cameras belonging to several of his victims. Homes belonging to his mother and five of his brothers were also searched at this time by over 300 police, uncovering a total of 24 weapons, 250 kilograms of ammunition and several more items belonging to the victims. Malat appeared in court on the 23rd of May, but he did not enter a plea. On the 31st of May, Malat was also charged with the seven backpacker murders. On the 28th of June, Malat would sack his defence lawyer Marsden and sought legal aid to pay for his defence. Meanwhile, his brothers Richard and Walter were tried in relation to weapons, drugs and stolen items found on their properties. A committal hearing for Malat regarding the murders began on the 24th of October and lasted until the 12th of December, during which over 200 witnesses would appear. Based on the evidence at the beginning of February 1995, Malat was remanded in custody until June that same year. On the 26th of March 1996, the trial opened at the New South Wales Supreme Court and was prosecuted by Mark Tedeschi. His defence argued that in spite of the evidence, there was no non-circumstantial proof Malat was guilty and attempted to shift the blame to other members of the family, particularly Richard. 145 witnesses took to the stand, including members of the Malat family who endeavoured to provide alibis and on the 18th of June, Malat himself. On the 27th of June, 1996, after 18 weeks of testimony, a jury found Malat guilty of the murders and he was given a life sentence on each count without the possibility of parole. He was also convicted of the attempted murder, false imprisonment and robbery of Paul Onions, for which he received six years jail each. Police maintain that Ivan Malat could have been involved in more attacks or murders other than the seven for which he was convicted. Based on modus operandi similarities, examples include Karen Rowland, 20, disappeared the 26th of February 1971, found in Fairburn Pine Plantation in May 1971. Peter Letcher, 
18, missing in November 1987, found in the Genoan State Forest in 1988, and Diane Panacchio, 29, who disappeared on the 6th of September 1991, found in the Talaganda State Forest in November 1991. Further given the possibility of an accomplice, the murder cases were kept open. On the 18th of July 2005, Malat's former lawyer Marsden made a deathbed statement in which he claimed that Malat had been assisted by his sister Shirley Soiree in the killings of the two British backpackers. In 2001, Malat was ordered to give evidence at an inquest into the disappearance in the Newcastle area of three other female backpackers. Leanne Goodall, 20, disappeared 30th of December 1978. Robin Hickey, 18, disappeared 7th of April 1979. Amanda Robertson, 14, disappeared the 21st of April 1979. A related cold case is that of Gordana Kotepsky, 16, who disappeared in 1994. Although Ivan Malat was working in the area at the time of the crimes, no case has been brought against him due to the lack of evidence. Similar inquiries were launched in 2003 in relation to the disappearance of two nurses and again in 2005 relating to the disappearance of hitchhiker Annette Briffer, but no charges were laid. In 2010, in a media interview, Onions described how he accepted but did not use a $200,000 reward granted for his part in the conviction. Malat was held in a high security unit at Goulburn Supermax, home to Australia's most dangerous criminals. And in May, he was then transferred to Long Bay Jail in Sydney. After arriving at Two Long Bay, he was diagnosed with terminal esophagus and stomach cancer. How's that for karma, people? During his time in solitary confinement at Goulburn, he had been on several hunger strikes and sometimes would swallow sharp objects if guards did not meet his demands. And I actually remember hearing about that on the news of Malat self-harming and going on these hunger strikes while he was actually in the Goulburn prison. So... Yeah, he still looms large in people's minds even today, even though he has been long deceased for a while now. The legacy of the Malat murders has endured, unfortunately. And in 2012, Malat's great-nephew, Matthew Malat, was sentenced to at least 30 years in prison for the axe murder of a friend in the same forest. And yes, we are talking about Belangelo. The court heard later that he had gloated about the murder, saying, that's what the Malats do. I just think that's so creepy that he was actually pleased that he'd been convicted of this murder and just sat up there and told everybody, well, that's just what we do. Many of those linked to the backpacker murders had held out hope that Ivan Malat would reveal more about his crimes before his death. In October, Carolyn Clark's father, Ian Clark, told a reporter he still hoped for a deathbed confession. He said, we still think of Carolyn every day, but it doesn't mean to say that we have to think of Malat every day. Clark told the Australian Associated Press from his home in Northumberland, if he was able, if he was to finally face up to the fact and admit to any of the others that he has done, if indeed he has, then I think that would be a wonderful thing for those parents. Because for the short time we didn't know, I know just how they would be feeling. Unfortunately, it was not to be. Malat would pass away due to cancer on the 27th of October 2019 at Long Bay Correctional Complex, Sydney, without ever having confessed to any of the crimes that he was convicted of, nor to any that he was also suspected of. Leaving the family of his victims and potential victims with still very many unanswered questions and in some cases never knowing what happened to their children and no sense of closure, no way to say goodbye to them or to give them their last rights that they were so deserving of. And that is where we finally come to the end of the backpacker murders and 
Ivan Millet. And just to add to Ivan Millet's Very Grizzly scorecard, there was a belief that a young girl who was about to become a nurse and go to nursing school, she was waiting to find out if she'd actually gotten in. Narelle Mary Cox from Grafton disappeared in 1977-78 and she was actually in my first missing down under case that I covered here on the channel because she was a local girl. There were suspicions that she may have also been abducted and murdered by Ivan Malat. The direction that she was heading was from New South Wales, south heading north towards Toowoomba, I believe it was, up north, to stay with a friend for a few days while she was awaiting news to see if she'd been accepted by Cairns Hospital to become a nurse and be accepted into their nursing program. So she would catch a lift with the truckie, she would actually get out of the truck halfway between Grafton and Toowoomba and she would never be seen again and it was found that Ivan Malat was actually working on a road crew in the area that Narell had disembarked from the trucker. And she was never seen again and the family always wondered if she hadn't fallen victim to Malat. So if you would like to watch the video on Narell Mary Cox, uh, that I first was one of my first missing down unders that I posted, I will include a link to that video in the description box below. And as for today's story, that's going to do it. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I know he's been a heavily requested real crime down under that a lot of you have been wanting for a very long time. So that's why I chose to explore his case today. And also would like to thank you all so, so much for watching again. Thank you for supporting me. We are now up to just over 150 on the channel, but I need more. So if you're actually watching these videos and you haven't subscribed yet, please do so because I think a lot of people still don't understand that it is your subscriptions that help further our careers here on YouTube. When you first become a creator on YouTube, uh, they, they send you all this stuff when they realize that you're creating um, like the people from YouTube. One of the stipulations to be accepted into the YouTube partnership program is that you must have 1000 subscribers and then you can start having your videos monetized and when the videos are monetized that means you have a way of supporting yourself it also has a way that you can buy better equipment to shoot your videos with and it also opens up a bigger scope of travel to do more um, content away from my local area what i really want to do with my team at clarence valley paranormal and we can't do that without your help and is your subscriptions that actually further us here on youtube so that's why all of us are always asking, please subscribe and hit the bell button so that you don't miss any of our videos. YouTube also plays close attention to your likes and your comments. So if you could also drop a like, drop a comment, and you can also, you know, share any memories that you have growing up with this case or anybody you think he may have abducted and murdered, or just your opinions on Ivan Malad and the case in general, I'd be happy to hear it. Please keep all comments and um, discussions respectful here on YouTube. Uh, we want it to, to be a nice place for everybody. So everybody's welcome to this channel. Um, just please always be respectful to me and to everybody that's commenting. As um, I've noticed, a lot of you have been. I have some amazing subscribers and some amazing people commenting. So thank you all so, so much for being so positive and so kind to each other and to me. And um, yeah, if you could just subscribe, that would mean the world to me and it would help me get further and help me make even better videos for you guys, which is what I would really love to do. So coming up this week, we have a new segment for the show. Hopefully we'll be airing in a couple of days, which is Unsolved Down Under, where I'm going to be digging into some really strange unsolved and uh, forgotten cases here on the channel. We have more weird and wonderful with the Oz Files, The Truth Is Out Back. We'll have another missing persons case and we will have more disasters as well to explore. So thank you all so, so much again for watching. I hope you have a great week. Everybody, please stay safe. And I've said this so many times before. Please do not hitchhike or get into a car or a truck or anything with somebody that you don't know. Ivan Malat's gone, but that doesn't mean that there aren't further predators out there still doing these things that we don't know about yet. So please stay safe. You know, buy a ticket, travel with friends. Do not go anywhere on your own. 
because I would really hate to see one of my subscribers end up as a video on this channel. That is something I just would never want to see happen to anybody. So please stay safe, everybody. Stay happy and much love to all of you. And I will see you all back here again really soon. Bye. And before we end the video for today, we need to pay respect to the victims and the suspected victims of serial killer Ivan Milat, Anya Hupsheed and Gabor Norgebauer, Simone Schmidl, Carolyn Clark, Joanne Walters, James Gibson and Deborah Everest, Karen Rowland, Peter Letcher, Diane Panacchio, Leanne Goodall, Robin Hickey, Amanda Robinson, Godova Kotetsky and Narelle Mary Cox.